crisis, even when the economy recovers. So we have built-in massive structural deficits, uh, both in terms of debt service, in terms of the uh, pensions, public pensions we have, and in terms of our health insurance. And as a result, uh, we will continue to face, and cities and towns will continue to face, an increasing problem of being able to offer services unless we change something fundamental in the way we do our labor management relations. And that's what we'll come back to in terms of questions and answers. But, Bob McCursey, why don't you give us a, your a perspective on these questions? I'm going to... Uh, thanks, Barry. I'm going to start with the question, really, that uh, Barry opened the session with. Uh, what's going to happen to uh, public sector uh, unions? Are they going to go the way of private sector unions? And, you know, just to kind of summarize uh, those trends, uh, Emeritus gives me a sense the opportunity to talk about being around in 1950 uh, when the private sector hit a high watermark of oh, about 35, 36 percent of the private sector were in unions, down now to 9 percent. And as you heard, uh, the public sector percentage has remained uh, fairly flat over the last decade, around 35, 36, 37 percent. The question is, is it going to decline? When you put those two numbers together, right now, half of all union workers are in the public sector. That's just an amazing, in a sense, shift. When I took up the study of this field, uh, in the 1950s, we didn't have public sector unions. It was just the private sector. That development occurred uh, in the 1960s. Anyway, it's good to be over here across the river from MIT to uh, look around the Northeastern campus. Uh, it's really an amazing uh, campus since uh, I was last here. In terms of the question, uh, most academics will, in a sense, look you know, on the left hand, on the right hand, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to, in a sense, talk about some trends, uh, some developments that I think pose real problems uh, for the extent of unionization in the public sector. But I'm also going to end, you know, with some thoughts about, in a sense, it just doesn't have to be as, as dire as, in a sense, some of the uh, evidence and some of the examples uh, suggest. As you know, and uh, Barry alludes to this, already we see a shrinking perimeter. Uh, in a sense, nibbling at the edges of the public sector with a thing called outsourcing. The thing that the Hyatt has, in a sense, put in the newspapers uh, for the hotel industry, where they just, in a sense, uh, took all their housekeeping and uh, sent it off to a uh, contractor. But we've seen it with garbage collecting. Where I live in Arlington, we've had private sector garbage collecting. Charter schools can be viewed as one form of, of outsourcing of, of education away, f away from unions, even though we have pilot schools here in Boston, which is in a sense a blend back, so the union uh, has a role. Uh, this week in Arlington, where I live, uh, the, uh, the town manager urged meeting uh, those folks who were in the town meeting uh, to write to uh, their uh, representatives uh, on Beacon Hill and say, he says, at the barest minimum, cities and towns should be able to join the GIC, which stands for the Group Insurance Commission, which is the state plan for insurance without having to obtain union approval. He is so frustrated in the negotiations with the unions to try to bring them into the state plan that he's saying, let's take this away from collective bargaining. So, in a sense, frustration is leading to efforts uh, to move away from uh, the normal give and take of, of collective bargaining. So I suppose, you know, uh, back in the 1960s when we were debating, you know, whether it was a good idea to allow employees in the public sector to unionize, government gave that franchise, gave that right, but government can take it away. And that's part of, in a sense, I think, you know, what the, in a sense, trade-off is right now. Um, if you believe in a kind of life cycle, which is what, in some sense, the private sector unions have experienced, that uh, here we are almost 50 years after the onset of unionization in the public sector, you would say maybe there is going to be a diminution of the union presence in the public sector, a kind of life cycle, you know, kind of uh, phenomenon where the institutional arrangements are in place, the contracts are there, 
Uh, but the pressure for change builds and builds and builds, what Scott was, was talking about. And then the question is, do we have regular adjustment uh, to deal with the pressure, or do we have a collapse, uh, as we've had some examples uh, in, the, in the private sector? Let me just give you some examples of resistance uh, to, to change. A community on the north side of Boston, where I know the town manager, uh, he went to uh, the public sector unions, primarily the police and the fire, and said, if you will freeze uh, your, in a sense, scheduled increases, I can, in a sense, avoid layoffs. And a guy sat at the table opposite him and said, I've just done the arithmetic, uh, Mr. Uh, Town Manager, and this is going to cost me $2,000 a year less than my pension if I don't get that increase. So he's counting, he's got a target for his pension. He's counting on, on getting there, and he's not ready, in a sense, to, to go along with that. Uh, a town on the west side of uh, Boston, uh, where the superintendent went to the teachers' union, not, not the MTA, uh, another, another union, uh, and, uh, and said, will you, in a sense, take a no wage increase for the first year of the next agreement? And if you do, uh, I can guarantee you that there will be very few layoffs. The teachers' union said, no, no, we need that increase. Uh, for the same reason of the uh, example on the north side of Boston, uh, I guess you're going to have to lay off the junior teachers. So you have, in a sense, the senior teachers saying, we, in a sense, have been here, uh, we've worked for these benefits, what's wrong uh, with a middle class, in a sense, standard of living? Uh, don't, in a sense, come to us and ask us to, in a sense, Take, take these cuts. You have people in some of these sessions who say, look, if we could just build the budget back up. Some people, in a sense, look at all the money that's going overseas uh, to Iran and to Afghanistan and Iraq and so on and say, wait a minute, just one day of those you know, efforts would, would solve our budget problem. So people, in a sense, are looking to protect what they have. That's you know, sort of the, the inside view. Uh, the dilemma for labor leaders is that if you have a group of people who aren't going to be hurt uh, by the layoffs, have their expectations to continue to increase uh, their salaries uh, for what they see as their expected uh, retirement, it's very hard for a labor leader, in a sense, to go against that because a majority of the people, in a sense, want, in a sense, the expected increases don't want, in a sense, uh, any of the cutbacks, and it's the majority who elect the labor leader. So it takes a very special kind of labor leader uh, to, to stand up and, in a sense, say, this is, in a sense, uh, what we have to do. It's somewhat reminiscent of the difficulties we're having in Washington with uh, health care. The majority of people in the country probably are okay with health care, but we're asking them, in a sense, to go into a new plan that's gonna help a small minority of people, the uninsured, and that is in a sense a tough trade-off. And then if you have uh, political leaders uh, who aren't used to compromise, uh, you in a sense are, are stuck in the status quo. I've been working with a university in New York State that's in a sense also in, in trouble, and, uh, and talking to people there as to why they're sort of locked into their current uh, position, uh, the labor leader says, you know, I'm born to be contentious. I like to, in a sense, uh, fight to protect the status quo. So, so to some extent, what we have going is that leaders become the kind of people that members want, in a sense, to protect the status quo. So this is kind of a pessimistic uh, picture that I'm presenting. Uh, so the status quo remains for the reason I've just said, and then as, uh, as Scott was saying, uh, and Barry also has introduced this, that the deficits increase, uh, the stimulus funds aren't going to, in a sense, be around uh, to, to rescue uh, the, the states uh, for, for a second go-round, and the pension and health uh, liabilities uh, increase uh, substantially. Uh, the other fact of life is that the majority of people today seem to be kind of down on government. 
uh, for some reason. And that's, I think, a question to, you know, to be discussed. When I first started uh, uh, my career, people were, were not down on government. Uh, but government doesn't seem to be the solution that uh, people uh, uh, look to. Uh, we had a speaker this week uh, over at MIT, uh, Michael Lipsky, who wrote the book uh, uh, Street Level Bureaucracy, and he was making this comment too. He works with an organization called Demos. Uh, and they're wrestling with this question as to why uh, people in this country do not see government uh, in, a, in a favorable light. And since they want to, in a sense, minimize the role for, uh, for government. Is it a function of the fact that the stimulus funds primarily have helped the banks and CEOs uh, and they just don't see government, in a sense, playing, playing fair with the interest across the board? Uh, I, I don't know. Building on what Scott was saying in terms of how the benefits within the public sector have, have built up, the numbers that you could put on what Scott was talking about is that in the private sector, if you have a dollar in the payroll, you have about another 60 cents in fringes. In the public sector, if you have a dollar in the payroll, you put another dollar 80, which is roughly what, what, what Scott was saying, another dollar 80 uh, in, into all these fringes that he was, he was talking about. So that the folks who are the taxpayers, and another reality is, that with the decline of unionization in the private sector, fewer and fewer taxpayers are union members, who in a sense have some sense for the historic mission of, of, of unions. So we have a number of ominous signs around us uh, right now. If you go on the web and put in taxpayer revolt, you will get many, many listings. All over the country, there are these, in a sense, groundswells of people saying uh, things, have to, things have to change. In one California community, a judge has voided the collective bargaining agreement because the community uh, went into bankruptcy. And I'm just waiting for some major city to go into bankruptcy and go to a court to void the labor agreements to give us for our current period, what Ronald Reagan did for the labor movement when he fired the air traffic controllers. In a sense, creating a symbol that says, in that case, to employers, you can take unions on, and a major bankruptcy and avoiding of collective bargaining agreements will be a symbol around the country that, in a sense, got a solution there in front of you. Now, bankruptcy, which I've looked at in the private sector, we've had a project on the airline industry, is not as bad as, as you would think. Government's not going to go out of business. It's not going to go to Chapter 7, uh, which is liquidation. Government's going to stay around. And it's going to provide, in some cases, I'm not advocating it, but I just see it coming. Uh, it's going, in a sense, to provide an orderly dismantling of the kinds of uh, arrangements and costs that, that Scott talked about. And in the experience in the private sector, primarily in the airline industry, judges tend to be fairly, in a sense, open-minded. They send the parties back, keep talking, keep talking. The judges generally don't take the motions of the employers uh, to rescind the contracts. They try to keep the contracts in place. But in a sense, they keep the pressure on uh, to change things so that, in a sense, the organization, in this case, the municipality, can be put back uh, on, a, on, a, on a right footing. All right, that's a very negative pathway. All right, is there a, another pathway uh, through the current crisis? I would hope so. Uh, here and there in the public sector, we see partnerships. We see examples of joint labor management committees. We see coming over from the private sector, total quality management programs. Uh, I'm heavily involved with other people in training people in interest-based bargaining, sometimes called mutual gains bargaining. And you get lots of people from the public sector who are using uh, these ideas. Uh, we have unions uh, like Tom's Union, uh, very much involved in committing to better outcomes, better things for the students, not just worrying about wages, hours, and working conditions. Uh, we have, in a sense, examples of reorganization taking place. We have a major reorganization taking place here in Massachusetts in terms of transportation you know, the mass pike and the tea and so on, and trying, in a sense, to uh, improve work rules. 
and those can be changed without threat to the economic standing of the people. So there's opportunities for, in a sense, much more flexibility. What I would call a fostering strategy, in a sense, working together uh, in a partnership way. And all of this is under the banner of accountability, which is a big theme today, that everyone has, in a sense, to be accountable uh, for the arrangements uh, that are in place. <coughs> Now, how would some of these partnerships and things be, be fostered? Well, there are some examples from the private sector. We had a period of time where we had a National Productivity Commission. We had examples where we publicized best practice. But I think it's an open question. How can we, in a sense, stimulate more work together on the challenges, uh, rather than the early set of examples that I gave, where people are, in a sense, frozen and just trying to protect uh, the status quo. So in conclusion, I'm very much a supporter of collective bargaining. Uh, I grew up in a union family. My father talked about being part of the IWW strike just before World War I. The Wobbly struck the, uh, the silk industry in Patterson, New Jersey, where I, where I grew up. I've served on uh, two boards representing unions, representing the Teamsters and the Steelworkers. So, and I started my study, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, back in the 1950s when, in a sense, the private sector was, uh, you know, really uh, at a peak. But now, 50 years later, we see what's happened to unionization in the private sector, and we see now all the pressures uh, on the public sector, which uh, Barry spelled out so eloquently in his op-ed piece. <laughs> Some of you would probably quote Chump here, who had this philosophy about the creative destruction of capital. Uh, we've seen some of that, I think, in the private sector, where some industries have come down, other industries have come, come up. We've seen it here in New England, where we lost the textile industry, and other industries have come in. That kind of cycle, that kind of shifting. Uh, is the same thing going to happen with respect to social capital, meaning the institutionalized arrangements that Scott, took, Scott told us about? Are they, in a sense, going to have to be uh, dismantled in favor of new ones? Is that a creative destruction in the Schumpeter uh, terms? So I end by saying uh, my mind sees, in a sense, the, the dilemmas here, the problems, in a sense, the scary things. But I guess my heart, because I've been uh, in the labor uh, area for so long, is, is hopeful that we can work through on a, in a sense, more rational, planned basis so that we don't, in a sense, have the convulsions that have happened in the private sector. Thank you.